Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, October 18th. First on our agenda this evening, we have a proclamation for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we do have Nellie Hill with Waypoint here to accept the proclamation. Please come forward. Okay, thank you for joining us. Whereas one in three women and one in four men will experience some form of domestic violence during their lifetime, and whereas intimate partner violence impacts victims, children, family, friends, and the community at large, and whereas domestic violence is not confined to any group or groups of people, but is experienced in all economic, racial, ethnic, educational, societal, and religious groups, and is sustained by societal indifference. And whereas perpetrators of domestic violence should be held accountable for their actions and victims should have access to support and services to help them overcome their experience. And whereas it is important to recognize the compassion and dedication of the individuals who provide support to victims of intimate partner violence and work to increase public understanding of this significant problem. And whereas a coordinated effort from all community members is needed to put a stop to this heinous crime. Now, therefore, I, Nicholas Abouassili, Mayor of the City of Marion, Iowa, do hereby proclaim October 22nd, October 2022, as <laughs> Domestic Violence Awareness Month and encourage residents to support Waypoint Services in Ending Domestic Violence to join the Gentleman Campaign on October 19th and urge everyone to work together to eliminate domestic violence from our community. Thank you. I just want to say on behalf of Waypoint Services and the survivors that we serve, thank you so much. We could not do the work that we do without the support from the community. Waypoint supports seven counties in Northeast Iowa, and on average, we serve around 1,700 to 2,000 victims every year. So your support means a lot, and it makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have a presentation of the Marion Strategic Plan for fiscal year 23 through 25. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Monica Allen, who's our uh, consultant, is joining us or is joining us via Zoom. I don't know what we. Monica, can you hear us? I can, yes. Hey, everyone. Monica? Can you hear me? Monica, we can see you. I don't know that we can hear you just yet. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear us, Monica? It's looking, looks like it, her, uh, looks like it's freezing up every now and then on her picture, Terrell. Okay, 
Can you hear me now? Okay, well, <clears throat> maybe we can we can start and then we, uh, Monica, as you're working on your audio, uh, I'll do the best that I can to walk us through. Um, Cheryl, if you, if you don't mind, next slide. Or, um, so if you recall back uh, in January, as we went through the budget process, we staff had, had talked about revamping our budget process uh, to include um, syncing it up with our uh, community survey and strategic planning process. Um, the city went through a community survey. It was back in the spring. Uh, and we want and, and we wanted to make sure that we had that information um, to help um, help you all make those informed decisions as we went and updated uh, the strategic plan. Um, from our standpoint, um, as part of the recommendation, it made sense. Uh, community survey, new city council taking um, taking office uh, gives folks an opportunity to take in the information from the community then um, set that target and then uh, work to uh, put, uh, approve the budget. So um, council agreed. And then in June, we had uh, two, two full day retreats. The first day was with staff. So when we went through our previous, um, our, our previous strategic plan, and then we, uh, the second day was, as you know, uh, with you all where we shared those key takeaways um, and, uh, wanted to bring it back before you today. Next slide, please. Um, I think we covered some of this already. Uh, the original plan was from 2021 to 2023. They had five focus areas with goals, objectives, and then really dove down into key strategies um, and put together some timelines for uh, departments as well as staff um, and other partners. Um, that at that time, uh, this was prior to my time, but uh, from what I understand, this was something that was new uh, for uh, our organization. Um, and then some of the things that happened, uh, the, it was a, the, the city went through the strategic planning process and then COVID and derecho happened. So that did um, cause some delay. And then um, uh, my predecessor left and then I came on board. So uh, some changeover. Uh, Hey, Ryan, can you hear me? Uh, Terrell, can you? Thank you. Um, we touched on this in the intro slide. Uh, we talked about re-envisioning the strategic planning process. Uh, we revisited that plan off cycle. Again, new, new city manager, timing of when the council members coming in, um, community survey to help inform where we're going and then helps uh, better align with our budget process. Next slide. And Monica, if your audio is working, feel free to jump in. Kelly, can you hear me? Go to the next slide. Thanks. No. Um, so this is this is the just a little background of where we were uh, in the winter. Um, Monica uh, and I met. Uh, other staff were part of that conversation. We devised that plan moving forward in the spring. Uh, reviewed the current strat plan and conducted a gap analysis. And then, as I mentioned, in June, we had the two-day retreat. Uh, the first one was, was staff really kind of dissect and, and try to be realistic with what we were looking at and develop some um, key recommendations for council. Thank you. Um, so on the slide, the, the, the key takeaways, um, let's, let's keep it simple. Let's not over-engineer it. Let's keep those same focus areas as they were valid. And, and a lot of the things that we have in the pipeline now are currently working on uh, aligned with those focus areas. Um, and let's focus in on the strategic, strategic and not that business as usual. And again, the really the big theme for us was let's be realistic with ourselves. And that's, that's a theme that we've heard from council and has been part of our conversation over the last couple uh, meetings with city council. And so the next day um, with the city council, you were receptive to the feedback. Um, council agreed on a plan that shouldn't be over-engineered. Uh, we did add 
uh, we spent a lot of time actually talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so that was a focal point. We did add um, some reference to historical pre preservation as something that was new um, and took a look at the vision statement and guiding principles. Hey, Ryan, can you hear me? Um, so this, if you can, next slide, Terrell. Vision. Um, so we had some tweaks to this innovative city with um, vibrant neighborhoods and abundant opportunities for all. Again, with the focus in on the inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, Hello. Brand promise, we kept it uh, as is. Marion is the best place in Iowa to raise a family and grow a business. And we do reach higher. And uh, our guiding principles act with integrity, being accountable to the community and each other, fostering a collaborative work environment. Next slide. Um, these are the focus areas we're going to dive in. Um, one thing on the far right, that's the new one uh, that we did add, and that's to focus in on the human component of Team Marion. Um, and there's there's a agenda item on later uh, in the meeting that will kind of hit on this key focus area. Uh, next slide, Terrell. Hey, Ryan, can you hear me? Phone, please. Thank you. Um, so vibrant community, again, the focus areas remain the same. Um, and this is what we all agreed on after our retreat, uh, make Marion a regional cultural and uh, entertainment destination for residents and visitors uptown uh, and all of Marion really um, the focal points. And I won't read through all of them. We'll just flip through. Hello. Next slide, thank you. Um, efficient and effective government, again, focus area number two. Um, how do we, sorry. Hello? How do we maximize opportunities, reduce risk, uh, look at partnerships and collaboration? Go ahead, Terrell. Community and economic development, uh, business growth, um, guided by planning principles, develops a sustainable, resilient manner. Next slide. Sustainable infrastructure and services. Streets, sanitary, sewer. Go ahead, Terrell. Sorry. Okay, next slide. This is the one that we, we did spend a lot of time talking on uh, both days as this was, a, this was something that was added. Um, Talked a lot about our human resources functions, the, um, you know, how do we position Marion as the employer of cho choice? Um, let's look at our environment, our culture, and how do we um, create, create that environment um, so we can optimize our, our, our workforce um, and then uh, enhance our employee experience through meaningful and intentional engagement models. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, um, these are the next steps. The, the one that's really important uh, to us is that create an, a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement for the plan. This was a lot of the discussion, if you recall, um, from the Saturday uh, retreat with council. Um, we have talked with Monica on this, uh, as well as our, our, um, our civil rights consultant, Thomas Newkirk. Um, and there's a couple ways that we're gonna, we're gonna tackle this uh, in our plan document. Um, for starters, uh, the mayor had talked about his transmittal letter when we get to the, the time frame where we actually publish a um, more of a, a, a brochure type strategic plan that we can disseminate out through the community. So we would have a transmittal letter from the mayor um, as well as some commentary from myself talking about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion in our community and the efforts that we as a city undertake to ensure that DEI is at the forefront for us. Um, separate from this, um, we are working right now with the Civil Rights Commission as well as some other community partners at the school districts on developing an equity statement. Um, we've got a draft actually tomorrow, uh, staff and I are meeting with um, a member of our Civil Rights Commission, uh, Mr. Mosier, to go through um, some of the edits and suggestions from Thomas Newkirk, as well as our, our city attorney, 
uh, Kara. Um, and really the, the idea behind that is to create an equity statement that is simple enough that can be included within all our branding efforts. So the plan is at this point to ensure that the statement, which will ultimately come to the council for final approval, um, to have that become part of our branding efforts. So any sort of document that we go out, we've got a box that has our equity statement on there. So as we put together the strategic plan, the mayor's letter, my commentary, as well as the equity statement stamp on that document. Um, and then we would incorporate that equity statement and other uh, materials that we market out. So that was a big thing that was, that was a big topic of conversation for uh, staff and council during the, the two days retreat. Um, and we in, had indicated we'd come back with a plan on how, how, to, how to do that. Um, the other thing that um, we talked about during that retreat is that the focus would be on the focus areas and those goals and objectives and not include the strategies until we get to the point where the, the city council is ready to approve the budget. Um, and once, when we have a good indication of the, the projects and initiatives that are included in the city's budget, what we would do is we will populate the, the, the final document to include those key initiatives underneath those key areas, those key focus areas. And so when the council gets the budget for approval, you will also get the final strategic plan populated with those projects and you'll approve, you'll be asked to approve the budget and the strategic plan in the same meeting at the same time. So that we can then draw a direct line from, from our strategic, the community survey to the strategic plan to the, bun, the, the budget tool that funds those activities that are all based on the community's input. Um, and then from there, some of the other commentary and what we will do is um, as a follow-up, we'll continue to provide regular updates to the council as well as the community on the progress of those, uh, those initiatives um, with the budget. Um, there's been talk of a dashboard. So once we get this all finalized and approved, we'll include the dashboard um, that would be included in documents on our website, social media, so people can follow along with um, how we're progressing along with those projects. Um, One other component to, um, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, Taylor, can you go one more slide? I think that's it. I had one other thought that um, it was a subject of conversation and it, it escapes me at this moment, but um, we wanted to make sure we had to check in with you all um, to go through the high level. Uh, we have provided the, kind of a summary document for you at your, your spot at the dais that sums it all up. Again, as we go through and finalize the budget, all those projects will be enumerated. Oh, um, the, the point that I was gonna make is during the retreat, the council had asked, how do we know from meeting to meeting we'll be making progress? And we talked about revising right. our budget or our, our agenda cover sheets to, um, put in a reference back to the strategic plan. So if you have an agenda item that is approving uh, a funding or, or a contract for a particular initiative that we're actually specifying which goal and objective it ties back to. So again, we're trying to increase our transparency and the connection back from activities that are being taken place, to funding back to the strategic plan, which can then be traced back to the community survey. So um, that is that completes the presentation apologize for the technical difficulties and appreciate your patience as as I went through a presentation that Monica had intended to provide. Can you, can you hear me? To answer them. Okay, we'll take take questions. Is Monica still with can us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? She still can't hear it, or we, we can't hear her, but she can hear us, it sounds like right. so. Monica, uh, sorry about the, the, the difficulties. <laughs> Hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to have you present to us again at some point, but um, thank you for, for joining us in any case. Um, any questions? Okay. 
appreciate all the work on this. This is great, great progress. All right, our next item is a Medco fourth quarter update. Nick Clues here. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time. Oh, that's so nice. Do you miss this building? What? Do you miss being in this uh, building? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to just provide a brief update, some things kind of going on, how our year's tracking uh, as far as the economic development space that we serve. Um, Mayor Abwasili, uh, City Manager Waller, have an opportunity to sit on our board um, and hear and see a lot of these things on a monthly basis, but we want to be really intentional and bring in uh, just a few of these updates back to the council. So first of all, uh, one of the new tools that our staff developed this year is it's an internal document that we use that's essentially a KPI dashboard that helps us to visually track and share on a monthly basis progress that we're making on some of our annual goals uh, with our board of directors. One of the things I want to highlight within this document is just the work that we do uh, on what we call business retention and expansion. What that means is how good of a job are we doing being out in the community connecting with the businesses that are already here? Uh, the ones that will continue to fuel the majority of growth uh, and expansion uh, in our community. So just a little bit of an update. Um, these are just some numbers that show the work that primarily Brady Quinn on our team, he's our uh, business retention individual, uh, is out doing. So we've had a really strong showing. This is through the end of the prior month uh, and just being out in the community. Um, in the real estate development side, these are some goals that uh, we set at the beginning of the year. We wanted to really do the right things so that we can celebrate big groundbreakings. Uh, celebrating big groundbreakings in the real estate space is often kind of the end point for us, right? We work really hard to do the right things to support these companies uh, growing. So from a project standpoint, we wanted to uh, mark some big groundbreakings. We'll show you some pictures of that, but um, those shovels at the beginning of the year all started white. We fill those in as we go. And so uh, the good news is we've hit our goals in, in that particular area. Uh, lead generation, uh, we talked about this actually just this morning uh, with our board as far as when we talk about business attraction. Um, it's a topic we could talk about here probably at length. Uh, oftentimes, most of our leads for new businesses come from the state of Iowa. They get funneled down through our regional partners who then send them to the communities within the regions. And we can then decide if they're good projects that we should uh, go after, provide information uh, to, uh, to try and pursue those projects, or uh, if they're projects that aren't just a fit for our community. So these are not re represented in this number. Uh, these unique leads that we've generated are based on activities that we've done on our own, relationships that we've cultivated uh, on our own. So we don't uh, necessarily measure in this uh, some of those uh, leads that just happen that, that come from state uh, uh, state um, partners. This next graphic does, however. So we have a goal of uh, hopefully responding to eight of those different, they call them requests for information, RFIs. Uh, these are the ones that do come from the Iowa Economic Development Authority. Every once in a while, there might be a unique lead from some of our partners at the Economic Alliance. Um, this is tracking the number of projects that we actually do respond to that we deem to be a fit for Marion. And oftentimes a fit means they're the right utility uh, users, right? Uh, these leads that come from the state often demand an intense amount of water. Uh, sometimes I send these off to Todd, Todd Steigerwald and he helps us oftentimes respond. And um, I don't even show him some that are like literally seven figures of gallons per day of water. That's not Marion, right? So we, we know that very easily. And same thing on the sewer capacity side, but so far, I think this number's maybe gone up one or two already since this chart, but uh, we have had some activity. And then we also track capital investments. This isn't total capital investment in our community a year. This is capital investment of projects that we have uh, supported in the community. So that's what that's looking like. These are a few of the groundbreakings. Uh, several of you were there. A couple of great multifamily projects that broke ground earlier in the year. Uh, these are two groundbreakings from some uh, buildings out in the Marion Enterprise Center that are now under construction. Uh, one is a speculative building there on the left, just adjacent to the airport. Uh, the other one, uh, I was out in Jones County late, yes late yesterday afternoon, and as I was driving back into town on 151 off to the south side, 
uh, you can see the uh, steel going up in the air for the second building, uh, which is the picture on the top right. Uh, that's uh, 2040 building concepts. Uh, one of the investors is Chad Pelly. Uh, that building is looking great. So we love seeing that verticality, that steel. And then on the bottom, community housing initiatives that Ironically, they wanted to break ground quickly, but then have had some challenges with their tax credits. Uh, do still intend on moving along. This is the building down by sink back um, that we anticipate getting going. Um, we track the number of partners that are aligned with us and supporting our organization financially. This year, our board of directors uh, adopted a goal to, for the first time ever, get to 200 business partners. And right now we're tracking very well uh, towards that. It's been a strong year for bringing new partners on board. You can see where we uh, sit so far year to date. We share this chart uh, every month with our board. This is actually your data. So this is a measure of new, uh, the valuation of new permits uh, by property type. Uh, it's a really confusing, busy chart if you're just looking at it at first glance. But the bars are basically um, the orange represents the value of new commercial and industrial permits in that month. The blue represents residential. So and then those the lines uh, basically overlay well, what happened in the prior years. So, for instance, yellow is 2019, blue is 2020, green is 2021. So it allows us to track year over year. Uh, how those numbers compare. Uh, you can see as we got into June, July, and August of this year, we started seeing a pretty significant decrease in residential permits, which again, I don't think is any surprise based on market conditions that we know. So we watch that every month. Uh, we also track kind of our own project pipeline. So these are, uh, we break it up between active prospects, uh, projects that we have been involved with that are under construction, and then complete projects. Um, the thing that I really highlight here is what, what's the prospect activity looking like? And while it was relatively flat in the year, uh, you can see as we've gotten to the second half of the year here, there's still good activity. So while that, that number can be volatile because oftentimes one big project can make up the majority of that, I think when I, what I want to communicate here is all of the headwinds that we faced economically as far as costs of construction, interest rates of, of borrowing, um, there's still projects out there that we're able to talk to and engage with that are still considering investments in our community. So that, that's a positive. Uh, I'm not going to go through this by detail because chances are good this ended up in your inbox over the last couple of days. Um, this year we launched a, a new survey. Uh, we call it our community index. Uh, every quarter we ask the same questions of our business partners uh, that try to uh, just uh, gauge where are sales, uh, where have they come from the year prior? Where do you project them going? Uh, we asked some questions about supply chain, about workforce demands. Um, I won't go over this again because this is pretty fresh data. Uh, one thing that we, that we have noticed um, as we just compare from the previous quarter, um, things like sales growth, uh, companies anticipating that over the next quarter, those things are gonna begin to slow. Um, you can look through this, it's pretty self-explanatory. I just wanna point out, it's an, extra, it's an extra tool that we added because when we do BRE, we meet with companies one time a year, right? We go out, we collect some information, we do a survey, and then we don't necessarily have a good way of continuing to collect information about what's happening in their company. So we launched this community index as a supplementary way for us to receive more timely data back from those companies because we don't necessarily have the capacity to meet with all of these folks as many times as what this survey has allowed us to collect some data. Public policy, real briefly, I wanna make a connection of some of the work that we have done in the public policy space to specific projects here in our community. Um, the construction manager at risk legislation is something that our, industry, our, our uh, professional association has been deeply engaged in for the past several years um, with several other partners, but that was a bill that obviously was finally passed after many, many, many years of lots of folks trying to get that legislation across the finish line. And obviously um, the city is considering using that for the Plaza project. So a great tool that right away our community is able to leverage. Uh, Brownfield Grayfields, uh, this was a big issue a couple sessions ago as that tool was getting ready to expire. Um, this is not official yet, but the Brownfield Grayfield uh, Advisory Committee met a couple of weeks ago and is recommending that the redevelopment, the housing project attached with the Methodist Church uh, over here, 
um, they're recommending it for a $1.5 million award in Brownfield tax credits that will go to the Iowa Economic Development Authority Board uh, at the end of this month. So historically, the IEDA board does not make any changes from what the Brownfield Grayfield Advisory Committee recommends. So we're looking forward to that kind of being the first big win as far as uh, some resources to begin pumping into uh, that particular project. And then you can see a couple of uh, workforce housing tax credit bill uh, projects that were awarded just in the last month. Uh, phase two of the Green Park Apartments, so not the building under construction now, the next building, uh, that's what uh, was awarded tax credits. And then the Broad Main on 6th project uh, just across the street here, the one that's not built yet was also awarded a workforce housing. And then another uh, piece of legislation that will continue to be priority, maybe even more so this year, um, as we think about the legislative session, is making sure that we're protecting uh, some of our tools that are really tools um, that are designed for you all, for us all to manage locally, local control. Uh, we oftentimes have examples where the legislature likes to dabble in spaces that um, really are designed to be controlled by the municipality. Tax increment financing is one of those. We continue to be strong advocates for that. Um, we're not going to necessarily dive into the specific issues, but um, literally before I left here, I sent you all an invite. We are once again having our legislative roundtable together with professional developers of Iowa. Uh, the dates there on the screen, the emails in your inbox, hopefully you can uh, attend there. Quick update, we are talking about this later today. You guys are considering some additional support for Marion Community Build. That program has been out of the gate strong here in the fall. We have 20 students this year that are working on these projects. Uh, this is a photo of some students just a couple of weeks ago building the new garage uh, on this particular home that, uh, that we're working on uh, down on Third Avenue. And then just to wrap things up, uh, we had a great uh, kind of some kickoff to our strategic planning session just this morning. And um, we're excited to just continue to do great things in this community. Um, these were some questions that our board uh, pondered. I know that's small text, um, but we're just always trying to continue to step away from our work, evaluate how we can continue to do better, to work collaboratively with all of our partners and to continue to do the right things that uh, grow this community in the right way. So we're excited about uh, that continued journey. Stop by and visit us. Yes, we did finally uh, move out uh, last week. So these are just some photos of our new space. Just this is this is the community space. So we want to fill it up every day uh, with different groups that are utilizing it to grow their business. And um, stop by because we'd love to uh, love to show it off to you further. Last thing is we are officially opening a co-working business on uh, November first. It opens. It's called Cowork Eleven Oh Seven. Very creative. That is our address, is 1107 7th Avenue. Uh, you may have some, seen some things online. We're starting some signups and are excited to uh, bring co-working back to uh, Uptown Marion. So finally, last year, our, um, our board spent time each month reading through this book. It's called Economic Development is Not for Amateurs. It's written by a site selector, uh, a national site selector that we've had the opportunity to meet. And it's a great high level overview of what it is as economic developers that we do, what matters, where as a total community should we be focusing our efforts. Uh, we were at a conference a couple of weeks ago and our partners at Alliant Energy provided additional copies to everyone who attended the conference. And so as we leave here today, I'm just gonna leave a copy with you all uh, to look through just to provide additional insight into the really diverse amount of work that we do. Um, as an economic development team in the community. So I'm sure Rachel is staring into the side of my head saying you're over your time, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Only by three minutes. Oh, well, that's not bad for me. Any questions for Nick? Here, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, so um, Nick, you, you outlined early in your uh, commentary about what I would refer to as the pipeline for, several, uh, for your leads. Mm -hmm. And I think you said the state and then regional partners, and then through that through that pipeline, you're made aware of things that are potentials for us. Some of some fit, some don't. Is there what other pipelines exist? I think you referenced that there's some independent work that you do, but I was trying to understand. Uh, really, is that the primary pipeline, or are you working across multiple pipelines to assess opportunities? So, in when we say a pipeline, within that there's 
projects that are new companies to our community. There's projects that are existing companies uh, in our community. Um, we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about this uh, this morning. Business attraction, uh, Ms. Menser would probably be able to relate to this too, is a, um, a word that when you talk about economic development, every, everybody wants to do and do well. And um, it's, uh, it, it's that activity that always captures the headlines when you recruit a new company to the community. But it's also the activity that is extremely resource rich you can spend a lot of money for very few results, and you have to be just very intentional in doing it um, in, in as focused as a way that you can to fit the unique product and community that you are. Um, as a region, we do business attraction. I think even as a region, we would question if we do it all that effectively. So um, when it comes to business attraction, we often say that we market regionally. So we don't do a lot of direct business attraction ourselves. Um, so we, we rely on our partners to do that. In this case, it's our partners at the Economic Alliance, uh, kind of a little evolving going on, but um, ICR, uh, which is kind of a regional effort between the north and southern ends of the corridor. We really rely on them to do that. And then if and when they're able to find someone that likes our region as a whole, we're then brought to the table to sell locally. We're brought in because we know the unique attributes of our communities best. And that's kind of the model that we have always used, market regionally, sell locally. And however, there was interesting dialogue even this morning about how as a community-based economic development group should we consider perhaps upping our own game to do some additional business attraction ourselves. We don't know what that strategy looks like. Again, that's a very resource intense um, operation, but as we collectively have goals to accelerate how we're growing tax base, um, bringing new investment to the community is naturally a part of that. I didn't fully answer your question though about pipelines. I talked mainly about where some of these big leads come through, um, but we get a lot of direct contacts uh, from companies. So when I talk about projects that are in our local pop pipeline that don't come from some of those regional um, leads, Oftentimes it, it's, it's those direct contacts that we're receiving uh, from companies. It's perhaps a ping that we get through our website. Um, believe it or not, we have kind of some, some of those creepy analytics and tools. Um, we know who's looking at our website and sometimes we find reasons uh, to reach out to some of these companies if they seem to be legitimate and make sense. Um, but that pipeline can be assembled in lots of different ways. Sure, no, you've given some useful context, thanks. And a lot of projects are just people that have a project that they want to do in Marion. They come to the city and the city, Metco is a partner of the city and, and we're, we're a, an investor in Metco and Nick is part of the city's economic development team. So then he guides them through the process of selling them on the community, the incentives programs, state the state incentives programs um, to make the project work. So sometimes it's just people that say i want to do a project in marion on their own it's not through some pipeline so um, yeah go ahead yeah but i'm assuming nick that, that i mean you're right that when a new business comes to town it gets the headline but if i recall in my days when i was on the medco board many years ago the statistic that still sticks in my mind you tell me how close it is today is that a high percentage of your effort and the new jobs in our community come from existing businesses. So 80%. that's the number I had in my mind from 25, 30 years ago. So that has not changed. So again, we talk about the pipeline, we talk about the importance of that, but really the main effort still has to be with the existing businesses, but yet you got to spend time over here. So yeah. I want to make sure everybody understands existing businesses is still the main foundation of new jobs. Yep. Before the end of the year, Brady Quinn will be here. If you remember last year, we kind of rolled out this year end report of our BRE activities before we get to the end of this calendar year, he'll be, he'll be back to present that report for the year. Yeah, I think Steve's right in that the best kind of economic development is growing the existing business because they're already invested here. They're already emotionally connected here. And, um, you know, they're, they're the 
best prospects to uh, to gain in, in jobs and, and uh, economic growth. So uh, I think Sarah had a question. Or maybe a few. Okay. It grew, but even, even more. I mean, some of it's just your feedback. Um, as you talk about the pipeline and you talk about the partnerships of what's going on, and because that's a key part of our puzzle, is have we ever talked about having the economic alliance present to us, maybe with you or in support of, or however you see that working on how they work with Marion? I mean, I know we are also a contributor to them, so maybe there's a way to have that process happen too. It's kind of my point of question. We've uh, we've done that before. I've stood up here uh, with Doug Newman yeah. uh, before. I, I think our our relationship with that organization has continued to I I just think be. Um, one of our strategic goals is to be the best, the model of being the best community partner within the region as possible. So for instance, um, Brady has gotten involved in some of their regional strategies like um, the Talent Hub, if you've heard about that, or Ignite ICR. We're trying to make sure that we as a community are as engaged as we can be in some of those regional strategies. I actually sit on the Economic Alliance's policy board now, uh, which is their their top board. So it's nice that we're provided a, a seat at the table. Um, from a formal standpoint, though, right now, anyway, we look at what they provide to us through the city's investment in the Economic Alliance is business attraction and additional public policy support. So, so to add on to that, uh, as I've been onboarding and becoming familiar and meeting some of our partners in the region, like Doug, uh, we've so Doug or um, Brad DeBrower, our transit uh, contact at the city of Cedar Rapids or Roy uh, with sewer. We've talked to them about making sure they come up and present to council and, and share. So to your point, Doug and I've had that conversation a couple of times, uh, just about finding when is the right time and start starting, um, starting that process to get them. Okay. Cause I think as you're alluding to, it's a lot of layers and it's a complicated piece. And I'll come back to, and I've used this phrase before, back in my days in this world, um, your world, we had a presenter who was a nationally known kind of a trainer conferences that we often heard of and used to say, you know, we do economic development and quality of life. We don't know what that is, but it sure sounds nice. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's such a Thing that for you to put statistics and numbers to is to kind of help us understand because we all know that much of what you do every day is creating what happens here, but it's a lot of behind the scenes work that makes that happen that you can't quantify until that building goes up. So I appreciate that piece of it. Um, question with what is that we know there's infrastructure pieces that we are never going to meet. We are never going to produce the water that a Cedar River paper plant would do that you're going to have that type of a manufacturing facility in our community, nor are we really targeted to be that type of heavy industry. Are there things that we are not doing as a city or that we could do better that helps to create the environment to enhance job creation or help our locals grow in their job you know, the entrepreneur. I mean, that's how we all know that many the, quick, the, the companies came to be here. So are there things we should be doing? You know, I think right now um, it's, it's really, it's about workforce, right? So we can do some strategies about, you know, equipping future pipeline of workers. Um, I think collectively we, we're going to be looking at ways how we can intentionally continue to grow population. Um, I think when you look at some of the things that the chamber really leads, um, and quality of life more and more that kind of aligns with the traditional uh, approach to economic development like you have to have that to do this. Um, so I think all of those things that we're doing as a community um, are continuing to set us apart when it comes to competing uh, against other municipalities. Um, okay. So I don't have anything big to offer you to that. I think I think we're doing a lot of the right things. Okay, so then on that kind of that same trend, and I'm sorry, I know this is over our time, but um, it's a critical piece for our community. And I think coming off of the chamber's presentation yesterday and the, some of the conversations we're hearing about economy and jobs and what we have, um, what is, and after COVID and the change in the way people are working and the, you know, I think we've just seen kind of a shift. What do you see? Do you see economic development the way it was? Do we see job creation and the types of companies 
or the office buildings or the things that we used to see and traditionally think of as development continuing to be that or do you see it are we are you talking in the industry of a pivot different directions i mean are we what are we i think we at? still have some time to tell really where we're going to land you know it was interesting when we were doing our business retention visits at the beginning of 2020 I'll lose track of what years were what I remember a specific visit that we had with one of our larger employers who had just gotten done investing multi-millions of dollars into a call center space. And we asked the question of what are you most proudest of as far as your, your biggest accomplishment here over the last few years? And the response was the culture that we've created here with our people. Fast forward to 24 months later, that same amount of real estate was up for lease because that company had fully pivoted, sent all of their people home. No more human interaction in the office space. And I, I ask, where, where will we land long-term as far as how that impacts the culture of your company? That's an extreme example, but I guess the good thing for Marion is we're not a community that's filled with all of those traditional employers, lots of office space. So when we look at kind of the impacts of the pandemic on real estate, we're a little bit insulated from that just because we don't have a huge amount of office space available to the market. Now, when you talk about work from home, remote work, uh, the good thing is, as compared to a lot of communities, we're pretty well situated position from a broadband uh, services uh, standpoint, we can always do better. I think we'll have the opportunity to continue to do better as we have some of our providers continuing to build out, specifically I'm on in our community. That's, that's a good thing. Um, but some of the strategies that we've implemented to support entrepreneurs, some of the programming that, that we've launched, the, the co-working operation, we're trying to draw out and connect with some of these folks that may no longer have the traditional place to work but that we've got to figure out how we can connect them with community so that they stay here long-term. Um, those are just a few things that I think about uh, when you ask that question. Well, you are our connection with that group in these conversations. So I was just kind of interested to, to hear about it. And then I've just got one final small one. And that is, I hope as I look at the pictures and I don't see chamber ambassadors at some of those groundbreakings that that is those are not companies that have decided not to invest in our chamber who does so much for our community, but that they hadn't done so yet. And that's probably more of a statement than it is a question. There you go. That's exactly <laughs> what's happening is oftentimes we get to the end of these projects and they may or may not choose to be uh, members of the chamber, which is when you see either red or no red, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yes. And based on all we have going on here in the community, I, um, and all that our chamber has done to help with those quality of life pieces that keep people here. I hope that those companies are recognizing that benefit to what they're giving back to that community that they're, they're building in besides what their bricks and mortar building is. So, but you know, that's my passion. So I have to get that part in there. Thank you. I think one additional one, I mean, trend that you know, how things are changing is that cities are becoming much more involved in economic development themselves. And certainly our city has. Um, you know, we're trying to create economic development opportunities and leading and our investment in infrastructure and uh, placemaking and quality of life uh, amenities. All those things are geared with from a, from a lens of economic development and creating greater opportunities uh, here. And uh, we're lucky here because we do have great partners in Medco and the Chamber, and we all work mm -hmm. together on every project or most projects and uh, get a lot done that way. So this morning at 10 o'clock after we had spent two hours in our offices for strategic planning, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Kim and Ryan and Tom and Jill and Brooks usually there and myself and Brady. We do that every week. I think that's the unique thing. Uh, when you look at collaboration, when I go to different conferences, there's not a lot of communities that figure out how to align each other in those ways. Um, I think we are unique in that we actually have a document that Jill and I created a couple of years ago that really set our organizations side by side from each other to when it's asked, communicate, here's the spaces that we support. Um, not many communities uh, even have the relationships of individuals be between those entities to come together and be able to define that clarity. So I, I not to toot our own horns, but I, I do think we're leaders and unique uh, in, in those arrangements and how we do all work together. Okay. Thank you, Nick. All right. Thanks. Okay. I'll have I'll have it done.
for the Hilker part. <laughs> Nick, I'll have my draft yet tonight. Okay, under the consent agenda, thanks, Nick. Under the consent agenda, the first item that's marked for discussion is A9. Prior to that item, is there anything to discuss? Was, is there something wrong, Ryan? Or, oh, no. Waiting. Okay. Anything in particular to discuss I need prior to A9? All right, we'll go with A9 then. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I believe that A9 will be pulled off of consent. Is that right? Um, we have a Councilman Brand, so it's going to have to abstain from that. Um, we, um, this is the next round. I believe, Terrell, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is the continuation of our ARPA plan, the implementation of our ARPA plan. Uh, we did have um, uh, the request from Medco, as, as Nick alluded to in his presentation about the community build uh, scale up, $100,000. We did run this through this council subcommittee, and then we had a discussion, discussion direction item from council at a previous meeting. Um, so this is just effectuating um, that direction uh, via a amendment to an existing 28E agreement with Medco and Marion Independent. Okay, straightforward. Just another example of the partnership. Okay, any questions for Ryan on that? All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, A10 and 11, any questions on those? Okay, otherwise A12. Welcome. Amber. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I wanted to bring forward a proposal, um, a professional services agreement from Red Dog Creative Solution, Solutions um, to provide some marketing communication support. Um, there were some funds that were previously allocated to uh, budget modeling software that are no longer needed for that purpose, um, but based on previous Council direction, um, we are asked to look at proposals for marketing support. Um, so this is a partnership that could help increase my bandwidth, help provide some tools that could be used throughout the organization, um, creating a style guide and a writing handbook, some easy to use templates, and then an overarching uh, strategic communications plan. So with your support, I would um, ask that we move forward with this, this uh, agreement. Okay, questions for Amber? Yes, Steve. Just a quick one, Amber. Is this uh, is this a kind of a one-time project, or is this uh, going to be set up where this is going to be a recurring expense based upon the services that they're going to provide? At this point, it is kind of a one-time partnership. But okay. um, if we find future things, it, it would be included as part of the budget process. Okay. Thanks. Any additional questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, Amber. I I presume the style guide will be um, a guidance document that can be used for several years. So that will be a deliverable that has longstanding value. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you, Amber. The remainder of page three is not marked for discussion. Any questions on any of those items on page three? On page four, E7 and F1 are not marked. Questions on those? Okay, F2. Uh, this is just a plan of survey, um, property located east of Lucor uh, Road, uh, and then uh, Royal, kind of east of Royal Oak uh, Drive. That's a new Skogman development. Kind of hard to see there, but it's, it's highlighted in purple. It's uh, just under 40 acres. Um, Plata surveys are really just designed to transfer property between owners. So this is creating two uh, two parcels, A and B, uh, basically a north and south lot, each approximately just under 20 acres. Um, the area of focus is really the north 20 acres. Uh, that'll be uh, purchased by the water department for, or ultimately the city, but for future water facility up there, as well as some of the balance of the property being used for park uh, development. Uh, the south 
20 acres ish was going to be uh, purchased by another entity no immediate plans um so it's just two parcels um uh, when development if development occurs you'll get your sidewalk and street completed along those sides there'll be no building permits and no further development without a preliminary and final plat uh, so the plat of survey is just for uh, transfer purposes only uh, and again for the future water facility as well as a potential uh, parkland on the north 20 acres plus or minus okay questions is this is this currently in the city limits I'm sorry. Is this currently in city limits? It is. Okay. The red line is the city limits on the. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's just, just on the edge. Okay. No questions. Thanks, Dave. All right. Uh, for the remainder of that part of the consent agenda, no, no items are marked. Are there any questions on those before we get to A one on the next part? All right. I'll turn over the meeting to the mayor pro tem for A one. Thank you. Give me twice in one meeting. Excellent. <laughs> You're all familiar with the Marion Messenger, our quarterly newsletter that is distributed to every household. Um, this is the contract to approve another two year agreement with the same. Um, companies that we've been working with for the last five years. Um, we partner with to the letter design on the layout and then um, work with Cedar Graphics to print the publication and mail it um, for a total cost of about 71 cents per piece. Um, the costs have increased over the, the last contract. Um, primarily paper costs are um, extremely volatile right now and then um, some of their raw materials costs have gone up as well um, but I did seek proposals and this one was um, most affordable by several thousand dollars so would request to um, move forward with this um, our residents value it as a, as a powerful tool um, the last community survey 86 percent um, use it as a source of information on on city news and happenings so would ask for approval on this contract. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, E1 through E5 are not marked. Any comments, questions? It doesn't look like it. So F1. I had several handouts in front of you tonight, and I forgot one of them. All right, the uh, first item is the uh, Marion Aircom Park first edition final plat. Uh, normally final plats are just run through as a consent item. Uh, as they usually match the approved uh, preliminary plat. Uh, what is being proposed is 12 manufactured uh, zone lots. Uh, access to development will be from Marion Airport Road, and then surety has been posted for uh, some of the unfinished uh, public improvements. Uh, on the screen today, right now, is the proposed final plat. Um, it's laying on its side. Uh, north would be toward the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, as you can see, it's 12 lots. These are all industrial sized, um, showing the primary access from the uh, Marion Airport Road. Uh, the one item of note on this will be the potential taxiway for the Marion Airport. And this is just the exhibit I just handed out in front of you. Um, this does um, potentially result in the city purchasing um, lot eight on the final plat. You can kind of see it there uh, with some of the runway or some of the, the uh, turn area. Uh, highlighted on the screen there. Um, final plat does meet the preliminary plat and staff is recommending approval. Any questions? Dave? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, one. Yes, Dave, just um, the turquoise buildings or I guess uh, structures, oh. those are uh, I, just for clarity, those are all anticipated or additional buildings that would be built. Yeah, we wanted to see where any potential hangar area spaces to go. They may be multiple buildings or larger building, but we just wanted to see uh, an exhibit of what, how it could how it could uh, 
could develop. Yeah, and I, I appreciate um, Mike and I had some correspondence on, on this and I appreciate the work that uh, Anderson Bogert did just to clarify some questions I had. So this is, uh, I think we've seen renditions of this before, but uh, appreciate that work. Just out of curiosity, the map that you get that map yes. up there. It's got lot five, mm -hmm. six, seven, eight. They also say lot nine, 10, 11, 12, and preliminary and final. So they did something change. I'm not seeing quite where you're. Well, your map up there didn't show it. But you printed us shows it. It's got preliminary and final. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably had to cut it off to get everything to scale <laughs> to the page. But nothing changed from the preliminary. Preliminary, I can't yeah. say the word. Preliminary to the final. Okay. Yeah. So the lot number changed a little bit. And so that might be what it's showing is the preliminary plat lot number, the final plat lot number. Gotcha. So yeah, they're just trying to make it as clear as possible okay. because they, they did change just the numbers. Yeah. And then there is a lot line that had a jagged line in it before. Now it's straight between the preliminary and final, but that was very minor. Number eight? No. Yeah, uh, eight and... Okay, that meant they answered my question. I was just a little confused there. Thank you. And no other questions? All right, moving on to F2. F2, uh, this is a an agreement with the boat construction. Oops, sorry, Carol, I took charge there. Uh, yeah, this is an agreement with the boat construction uh, regarding the deferral and of an of improvement to Tower Terrace Road uh, east of the roundabout with the, the corn sculpture in it. Highlighted there in red, um, this is basically the north side of the road. Um, Tower Terrace Road is really two lanes split by the median. Uh, a boat has uh, ownership of the north side. Uh, another developer has on the south side. Uh, so if we were to only build one road, it'd be westbound only. Um, be some elevation issues and just building one road. Um, so we'd like to try to get it all built at once in the future. Uh, so this agreement basically allows for the developer to submit a yearly surety um, for the for their cost of the improvements uh, every July, um, and it will defer it until uh, either the city council passes a resolution of necessity requiring the developer to put it in, or if the developer does any uh, further additions to the east kind of off the edge of the page there, then they'd have to put it in as well or revisit the agreement. Um, they could come in and post cash today, tomorrow, next year for the entire improvement. And then that would essentially end the agreement. We take it, the city will take the cash. Uh, we can either go ahead and put it in or just um, plan it for a future project down the road uh, at the time maybe the property to the south develops. Uh, working on the final numbers with the developer on the, uh, the agreement, but it should be should be signed up tomorrow. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Dave, the the landowner to the southeast of the area noted in red, mm -hmm. would they need to act in unison along with a boat in order to satisfy the requirements of this agreement? No. Okay. I'm going to build when the road gets. Yeah, built. when the road gets built. When their half, when they want to come in and develop their half, yeah, yeah, we'd have to. If if they were to come in and develop their half, that we could then trigger the city council could trigger a resolution of necessity requiring the developer to the north to build, and hopefully we could work out an agreement where they can one builder not build in each, not each building their own half. I mean, hopefully we work out where they could we build the entire road in its entirety at once. So the, the if I recall, and I don't have it up on my computer here, but the. Uh... The split was 25, 25 to the developers and 50 to the city. Yes, sir. Okay. So we're not gonna build half of the road. <laughs> okay. Not our intent. Is all of the property to the um, south of that going to be, or the that section of the road, I guess, built by the developer? Is some of that potentially going to be purchased by the city? 
potentially for parkland. That area. In the south? East. Yeah. Really depend. I mean, it, it could be done in a couple different ways. I mean, the idea is the developer will, I mean, it'll be all be done by the developer, but. The road. The road. It all depends on the city's priority, I guess. I mean, if, if it's if this is hanging out for 10 years and there's a project to the east and, and there's a desire by the council to get Tower Terrace Road in, it's something that, you know, we would obviously could go and proceed with and, and force the agreement, work with the developer to the south and get it done. Um, do the project or sell. I mean, obviously bid out the project and I'm sure one of those guys, actually, I'm sure one of those guys would probably bid on a, on a job anyways, but and get it done ahead of time, but I don't really see it being to the east for some time, so. Okay. Thank you. Any questions on F3? Well, I will turn the meeting back to the mayor then. Okay, the next item under the regular agenda is the public hearing regarding the post sale of uh, 524 10th Street. Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor. This is um, back in May of 2021. Uh, the City Council received a request from the current tenant to purchase uh, the, the property, which is known as the McGowan House. Um, we've had conversations, obviously uh, got direction from Council to continue uh, conversations with the current tenant. Um, we have spoken to the estate of Mrs. McGowan. They were supportive of the proposal um, from the uh, current tenant, um, the owner of Roots, Roots and Bloom. Um, so by law, we have to go through a public hearing before we dispose of any um, public property. So this is scheduled for Thursday. We have provided all the necessary documents to the tenant. Um, I, I say tenant because uh, Roots and Bloom is a tenant of the city uh, within that facility. Um, we did receive, uh, we provided those documents uh, to Cassie back uh, early part of October, um, October 6th. Um, we did hear from her uh, late last week indicating that she was going to review them. We, we, we were told she was going to have some information to us by yesterday. She did not. So she's having a meeting with her attorney tomorrow. Um, but um, just going through the legal documents one more time. But the uh, public hearing is scheduled for Thursday. Staff recommends proceeding with the public hearing. Um, and hopefully we'll have some information by Cassie by tomorrow on the status of those documents. If not, uh, we'll let the council know and you can keep that public hearing open until such time that we're, we're confident that um, they're comfortable with the, the legal documents. Okay, questions on that? All right. Mayor, yes. one, sorry, one more thing that um, I, I do want to highlight that I know was extremely important for uh, staff and council, and that is as part of the sale, uh, there would be a historic, um, historic easement that would be applied to ensure that the, the building stays as is. Um, and that should there ever be a time down the road that the city would have first right of refusal, meaning that the city could purchase it back, acquire it back to, to ensure that it remains um, in its current historic um, condition. Yeah, I, I appreciate, personally, I appreciate um, the extra effort that went into preparing that uh, conservation easement and uh, uh, making sure that the property uh, is, is preserved. Uh, and it's, um, so I, I think that, that we're all, that the community's um, well served by that. And I appreciate all the, everyone being in, being on board with that. And um, uh, I know it took, took a lot of extra work on part of CARA to put together that easement agreement. So thank you, CARA. Okay. So A3 is the next item. Thanks, Your Honor. I'm gonna, Lucas is gonna come up and provide the presentation. Uh, just a little background. Um, as I've been, as I was onboarding uh, into the organization, one of the things that I heard repeatedly about was the 2018 compensation study. Um, there's not a lot of trust and credibility within that document. 
Um, and as part of uh, conversations at the budget time, um, a lot of there was a lot of uh, input on the need to do a compensation study, especially as we start looking at the marketplace and uh, it's, it's extremely competitive. We heard from Nick about workforce. Um, we've had multiple conversations with the council um, and specifically as it relates to the strategic plan, which is why that focus area at six team Marion was was included. So um, the team uh, went through the selection process to bring forward a consultant to help us do a compensation study. Um, Lucas was instrumental in that, uh, as was Rita in our finance department. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Lucas to um, go through the recommendation for you all. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here to talk about the compensation study, as Ryan mentioned. Um, there were, has a list of things that we're going to run through. So as mentioned, in 2018, we did perform that compensation study and the results didn't, the results didn't quite meet the city's needs. Uh, historically, we haven't had any real formal structure over our compensation strategy, uh, especially as the market grows more competitively uh, today. Uh, we have been addressing needs on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we've reached a point where that's no longer effective and we need to now create that structure in order to uh, best sustain uh, our compensation strategy moving forward. So uh, we posted the RFQ back in uh, June of 2022, and the scope of the RFQ uh, was to evaluate our current structure, what our current structure is, um, and as well as our benefits package. Uh, we did include both union and non-union, uh, and it does include uh, all types of employees, full-time, part-time, and seasonal. We did include union. Uh, we do know that we're, we're locked into a contract uh, on, on that step scale, but we still wanted to benchmark how we sit with our comparable communities at that specific uh, salary. And so that'll help us benchmark uh, and, and get those uh, comparisons uh, as we try to be competitive in the market. Uh, one thing we did want to do is benchmark against private and public. Uh, we are not only competing against public organizations. We did want, want to uh, know what the, pup, bleh, excuse me, the private market is doing, uh, again, to make us uh, a little bit more competitive uh, in, with everything. Uh, one of the um, asks that we have was to assess to make sure that we're ensuring compliance uh, as it relates to FLSA guidelines, uh, making sure that uh, we're paying people appropriately, um, especially as it's marked uh, in their job. And then lastly, to make recommendations of our policy structure as well as uh, policy. Uh, that way we can have a solid base moving forward. And then again, we can be uh, sustainable um, as, we, as we continue to grow. So we are recommending Baker Tilly. We did have a few proposals. Uh, we'll talk about those in a, just a little bit. Um, we are recommending Baker Tilly for a few key considerations. Uh, one thing, given the 2018 compensation study, um, we did want to now make uh, this one really impactful for employees. And so uh, it was important for us to include in-person meetings. Uh, that would include interviews with employees, the kickoff meetings, um, all the way to uh, helping present to council when we get to that point. Uh, we have a couple in-person meetings up at that point to help make sure, one, we're following the process through and through, we're being thorough, uh, and help bringing employees along through that, employees and managers along through that process. Um, again, one of our key considerations was uh, benchmarking to private organizations. Uh, Baker Tilly definitely stole the game as it relates to the private markets. Um, the other uh, candidates or the other vendors that applied um, didn't quite have uh, what we needed to as, as uh, Baker Tilly has to offer. One thing that we did like with Baker Tilly, uh, Baker Tilly was gonna uh, present multiple options for us. So then that way we can best identify what best suits the needs of the city, right? So um, we'll, what we'll do is throughout the, after their assessment, we'll get together, they'll offer our four different options uh, and provide cost estimates and then that way we have those, as, those options to help present to you to help determine our next steps as a city. Uh, Baker Tilly will also own and manage the process. And what I mean by that is uh, we'll give them the data and from there, they're gonna really take it and run. They're, they're really making it their own. Um, so um, 
and by that we this allows us to really lean into their expertise their strengths uh, to help ensure that the end product is viable and that we have good data to to base off our decisions on uh, the total cost of the compensation study is around or is 91,760. So when we get to the comparison, um, both the, so we did receive four, four proposals. We did interview the top two finalists that we've identified uh, up here on the screen. Um, they had a couple of key differences. So both estimated the completion of spring 2023. Um, so, and then again, comparing that private market, Baker Tilly was a firm, yes. Uh, Gav HR, it wasn't their main focus. They would try, but uh, Baker Tilly has uh, the scope uh, to do that comparison to the private market. Baker Tilly also included updating job descriptions. Uh, this will help making sure that, again, we're being compliant in what we're advertising with our positions. Uh, Gav HR, it was, they offered it, but it wasn't included in their uh, final proposal. Um, again, having that main focus being in-person interviews, uh, Baker Tilly took initiative and put it in their proposal. Uh, GovHR did not include that in their main proposal. So um, again, we, we were leaning more towards having that in person. And then, as I mentioned before, the plans proposed, uh, the GovHR only did offer one. And so there you do see the cost difference. Um, while it is substantial, we do, Baker Tilly definitely has it. Um, they do the private uh, private market, they do in-person, um, four different plans, and then again, they own the process. Uh, GovHR, there was going to be a lot of collaboration between us, which is good, but it also offers a lot of room for um, just uh, getting on the wrong page. And so having Baker Tilly really own the process, we can really help ensure that the end product is, is a good base, again, to build off of. So this last slide, I kind of wanted to highlight just the process. And so uh, from there, we're assuming a November 1 uh, start date. Uh, so we have project initiation. Um, and so this will be kind of a kickoff call to like help kind of plan out how the project uh, is, is going to look. Uh, we do have in-person meetings, uh, the light blue there that you see. Um, in-person meetings to help kick it off with employees, managers, uh, leadership, just to kind of help show what to expect throughout this process. Um, from that, we'll give uh, Baker Tilly all, uh, assuming it's proved, assuming it's proved, uh, Baker Tilly all of our information, uh, job descriptions, um, pay scales, benefits package, um, and then what they're going to do is go take that data and do a market assessment from that. After that market assessment, four and five is kind of one step, but I wanted to differentiate them because I think they're both really important uh, steps. Uh, from that market assessment, they'll then uh, come up or produce the four different plan options for us. And with those four different plan options, what the cost estimates are to the city. And so once we have all of that in a big, nice package, uh, we'll then present to council and look for that guidance at that point in time. And that'll be in spring 2023. So I knew I threw a lot of information at you. Are there any questions? You did a nice job. Thanks. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah, Lucas, uh, first off, um, thanks for uh, tackling this. Um, first, a comment, as I just was scanning through their proposal, I noticed that they indicate they will not document or publish employee-specific information, which is nice compared <laughs> to the prior one, which did. And uh, so, and I also am uh, happy with the timeline that we have a work product that comes to us relatively quickly so that we can act upon it. I think the other one sort of had a natural uh, shelf life that we blew by and it was no longer useful information under any condition. Um, so my, that was my commentary. I guess my question is, you said there are four plan options that we can select from. Can you characterize what those are a little bit? And I'm assuming those are not in the base pricing that they've quoted us. Correct. So the base pricing is just the uh, study and analysis. Um, and then uh, uh, providing those four different options to us, um, that, that's kind of what the base uh, cost is. We don't necessarily know what the cost is post uh, recommendation, um, that'll come up throughout the process. And so um, your, what was the first point of that 
Well, I guess I'm is oh, the, still the we the, yeah. What plans. what are the options that we are will be obligated to select from yep. at additional cost? So right now we're kind of an open range salary pay band, um, whereas the contracts they're on steps. And so uh, when we take a look at compensation structure, is it we do we want to go to a step of you know this job is classified in this pay range, and then the first year you get paid this, and then third year you get an increase, fifth year you know, kind of doing a structured plan like that? Or do we want to base it off of another open range plan? Um, these these are the, you know, whether or not, so depending on experience, we can just say, yes, this is where you're at with your experience versus this versus this. So it, it's kind of, they're coming up with different ways on how to apply. Yeah. So right now most of ours are steps so they would come up with different recommendations different options for the city to pick of how do you implement that pay system so for instance there are some that some pay some municipal pay schedules might just say you have a starting range and you have an ending range and then it's discretion based on merit uh there's other that are just step programs so they would come forward and as after they've taken a look at all our data, come and present different options that would make most sense based on the market, based on what we have from a competitive standpoint with other comparables or other entities like Collins Aerospace and say, hey, this is how they do it. Here are some options that you could you could implement your pay system. And then how do you how do you deal with um, like the police and fire unions, which are traditionally uh, steps? how many steps do you have how you, do we need to have step compression so they would go through analyze and give us those four different options that we could then pick from and then from that then we will be able to do some cost analysis to understand what the total impact to the city would be for implementing such a, a plan okay so i i i think i'm understanding let me recast it here what my question is lucas um so there's a base uh, scope of work, which is at the quoted fee. Then there will be a, a presentation of uh, analysis option one, two, three, or four, which then we say, well, gee, we think we like two. And then two has an additional charge. Correct. So my, I guess where I'm really going with it, and this is, this is, a, is, that, the, is, is that the structure? What so we, we have to we have to be clear on the, the extra cost. The cost would be to implement the pay structure. The the quote that Baker Tilly, the ninety one thousand, is all in to go through create the okay. options. That's what I needed to yeah. know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. There's not an extra fee. The the okay. extra cost that Lucas is talking about would be the cost to the city to actually implement it. That's that's on us applying it right. to the individual okay. positions, the the okay. the ranges. What's our cost I, or operating cost? I, I thought we were. I thought we were nope. uh, base work no. and then additional charges no. to be defined. correct. And and that's that's yeah. that's part of as we as as our team went through and analyzed it. The other proposal, you know, if you're looking at it, the ninety one thousand versus the thirty six. There's a lot of stuff that would be added on to that additional one. Travel, on site meetings, on site meetings, as an example, is something very important for us because the 2018 survey does not have a lot of validity. I heard that from the elected officials, but I've also heard it throughout the organization from the employees that, hey, this didn't have credibility. And the importance for the credibility would be to have the on site interviews, things like that, make sure we're walking them through. Um, and then also managing the surveys. We're, we're staff, you know, we're, we're a very small staff here that we have to take care of our personnel matters um, in the day to day functions. And for us to start managing the surveys to other communities and other comparables, it's turnkey. Baker Tilly is going to run that process. Lucas, next time I'll promise to be more fully caffeinated for. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Okay, we'll go Sarah, then Will, then Steve. So maybe it was before me or maybe it was right when I was coming on, so it was all a flash. So we had one of these 2018, but we didn't like how it came out. So we're having to do this again. Correct. Right? Essentially correct, yeah. It's a quick summary. And so um, what didn't we like about it? So that's a great question. Um, there hasn't been a lot of positive remarks around um, the process. Um, can I jump in? Yeah. Because 
so Lucas wasn't here, I wasn't here, but what what I've heard, and I welcome any other commentary for those that were here that could speak to this, but it was it was a simple, it was a simple comparison that did not was not comprehensive in the 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 the, the strategy moving forward. It was just kind of where are you? Um, and, and quite quite frankly, the the perception within, especially with our unions, is that it was a tool that was used to negotiate against the union as they're going through. And how do we keep the the, the salaries compressed versus how do we compete with the with the market? Okay. So my next question is, how long? This is a lot of money. I mean, you know, there. Mm -hmm. I, and I like I say, I come from a nonprofit world where we scrape together pennies to do anything. And $100,000, give or take, for a study, for a plan, is a lot of money for a lot of companies in this town. So how long does this last? And is the, I guess I have two questions. How long is a study like this viable for use by the team here to do what you needed to do, barring weird things that happen, uh, right? Or, can, I, can I answer this? I'm sorry. Um, this what this does is it gives us a really good base and a starting point in time much like and i'm going to compare this to a, it's a complete extreme here i'm going to use this there the conversation we've had about our compens our, our comprehensive master plan we get it we do this study we get a snapshot in time we understand what our market is how we compete What's the structure? How do people progress through the range? How do we apply this? What's our strategy? Then it's it becomes as um, its longevity and validity remains as long as we manage it on a regular basis. That's why the 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 budget process that Leanne and staff have put in place is so critically important and how we are gonna start standardizing our process as we go along, because every year as part of that budget process, we will take this, the framework that we get from here and we will do an evaluation against the market to ensure that the things that we are doing are still keeping up to date. So this isn't something where it's like, oh, we did our study, now we were gonna work on it and five years later, oh, we're back, nope. it's time to do another study, we gotta redo our structure, it doesn't match up with the people we interact with. Correct. I, I don't I don't recall what meeting I was at today or yesterday, but we talked about the importance of having plans. We don't just take and do plans and put them on a shelf. The plans are important. We have to operate from those plans. The comprehensive master plan, our compensation plan, any plans that we have as a city, the strategic plan, everything that we're doing, we should be touching that at least once a year. So does this process potentially for the team members here, does it compare based on this is your industry job title, this is what an industry job title in your position pays at compensated comparable cities throughout blank, or does it take this is what you do and compare what somebody does regardless of title? Is it title-based or is it responsibility-based or do they, is this what this is about it's, it's, is trying to build it's a, it's, it's a little bit of both. And that's why when Lucas talked about the job description, that's why that's so critically important to make sure that our job descriptions are matching the work that they're doing so that we can then go ahead and compare ourselves to the industry. Um, we will look at, and this is, if you recall back in, I think it was March, where we actually had developed a, co a comparable policy. That was a monumental step for our community because we clearly identified these are the communities we want to compare ourselves with. The benefit of having Baker Tilly is they'll be able to go ahead and look at those comparables, but also others within. So we'll have some additional data to compare ourselves with. That private sector comparison is extremely important because when you look at a significant employer base, like Collins Aerospace, which is right in our backyard that's competing for engineers, attorneys, a lot of the, the folks that we have in this room, IT, right, we have in this room, that's where the ability to attract and re retain right now is so, so challenging for any industry. So it, it's going to do all, it, it, that job description, make sure it's right, make sure it's documenting what we're doing so that we can then accurately compare. And the other thing, um, in a previous life, um, when I was at Lake County, we went through this because we had state's attorneys, engineers, 
um, the the comparison to the private sector. It's you know, it's going to look internal, external. How do we have some consistencies? Um, and just it's going to be a fantastic tool once we have it and we start implementing it. That's going the implementation though. That is going to be a challenge. Just from a funding perspective. I mean, as we look at budget, we're waiting for the, the rollback, and I'm kind of jumping to a other significant issue. But as we wait for the state to issue the rollback order, um, you know, I, I really do believe that the state's going to have to look at how we do property taxes here. Because um, with the rollback, I mean, as we talked last year, um, they dropped the, the rollback by 2%, and that had an impact of between $1 and $2 million of revenue to the city. You know, and as we look at how do we fund police and fire and other other things like this, that's going to be an important thing. But having a plan, having the under, understanding and how do we phase that in and the strategy, that's important. Okay, well. Believe it or not, Grant actually thought of and asked all the questions that I had, so I'm good. Okay, Steve. Okay, first of all, I agree 100% that the last compensation study done was a complete bomb. All right. I mean, after it was presented, I don't think any of us up here had any confidence in what was presented. So as I look at how we're doing this today, it seems to be being done in the correct fashion based on probably better, better being done today than four years ago. So to do it, looking at both public and private is essential based on what Ryan just talked about. We have had conversations as a city council about salaries and compensation and benefits since I've been on here. And so including both compensation and benefits is essential. Updating job descriptions. Again, I've been involved in lots of these surveys before and as a company and an organization in prior life. And it's amazing how many outdated job descriptions you're gonna find. I will guarantee you, you're gonna find some that are 10 to 15 years old. So the challenge is once you get them updated is keeping them updated and what is your mechanism for doing that in the future? So as I look at what is being done, if it's done in the manner that is being described, I think we're all gonna have a lot more confidence in how things are gonna move going forward. So. $191,000 is a lot of money. I agree with that 100%, but it is absolutely needed to be done. It is a high priority that we have talked about as a city council for many years. So it needs to be done. I think the prior study was um, kind of a reaction. It was reactive. Um, maybe I think a couple of council members were really pushing for it. Uh, this seems much more... Um, uh, well thought out it, it it's more comprehensive and it you can see where it fits into the bigger picture of of, of uh, what we're working towards so i think it's a big difference so anyone else thank you thank you okay the remainder of page six uh, none of those items are marked any questions on those All right, we'll move on to page seven, B1. Mr. Miller. Your Honor, Council, thank you. Um, this is the project calendar for the trade packages for the new public services maintenance facility. We're to the point where probably about a week ago, we just finished design documents. So we're ready to put those into action. Uh, the facility itself really hasn't changed. It's the same footprint. Um, the foundation, we're using the majority of the foundations that are out there right now, uh, repairing those. The precast is already built. They've been in storage for over two years. And so we inspected those probably about three weeks ago. Everything looks great. So um, we would like to move forward with the trade packages. The facility, as you see, um, um, just over 100 and hold on. There we go. Let me back up. Sorry about that. So we have seven trade packages. Um, bids will be due December 8th, public hearing on the 22nd. Right now, estimate just over 17 million. So 
quite a bit more than what we anticipated. So 2019, um, I need to back up. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, 2019, the same steel building, uh, 1.4 million. Now it's just over 4 million. So that's what we're dealing with. Same design, uh, same site plan. So in February, just over 21 million. So now we're looking over 27 million, between 27 and 28 million. So that's where we're at right now. So it's way, way over budget, but we intend to issue the bids and see where we're at. So uh, schedule, um, that's what we're looking at. Completion date in 24. So any questions? Questions? Your Honor, go ahead. Yeah. So Ryan, can you comment on the, um, and I forget the, the acronym, what was it for the metal building? So I'll back up here. Pre, uh, pre Sorry, this is, there we go. Oh, there it was. So in 2019, the pre-engineered pre metal building that we let was just over $1.4 million. The same exact metal building was 4.3 million. And so we did that in 2022. So the cost increase between 2019 to 2000, 2022 mm -hmm. is uh, just about three times, almost four times. Yeah. So um, we're trying to work through this. Um, there's a couple of scenarios that we can work through, but we really don't have a good handle on what the pricing is going to be until we get the bid packages right. out there. So, so I, 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 I'm sitting next to the person who is probably most concerned about the numbers. Yep. So therefore I must be too, but my question really was going to drive to the point of this is a, is the pre-engineered metal building, isn't that a reinforced hardened It is. Structure? And so um, I, when we did the bids back in July, um, we had an option. And so we had the regular package, which is 4.3 million. It was $250,000 to go to the hardened structure, if you recall. And so what we're dealing with is some astronomical inflationary numbers when it comes to building packages. And so that's the main driver. And so the hardened facility that we chose to do back in July, that was a $250,000 ad. Okay, so that that is our design uh, criteria that it's a hardened facility. It is. Yeah. So okay. Council already made that decision in July. Yeah. I, and so the entire facility will be hardened against and be right. storm resistant. So, um, and I'll I'll go I'll go forward to this just so everybody understands. So, this is this is what we're looking at. So the design fees we're going to have about one just over one point two million dollars into it. Construction manager fees just over two point six million. The pre-engineered steel building alone was 4.5, between 4.5 and 4.6 million. And the precast wall systems, that's our storage costs. That's how much we're going to pay in storage for the last two years. And then the remaining trade packages, that's about $17 million. That's an engineer's estimate at this point. So we will not know what that figure is until we go out for bid and get the bids back and we can really finalize the budget numbers. Your Honor. Yes, follow on question yeah, but on the storage costs for the wall systems um isn't that a cost that is covered by insurance or other offsets so as of right now insurance has denied coverage on this specific building however as you know we're you know we issued a lawsuit if indeed insurance is to cover it they would cover that storage cost okay all right, so th that may be driven downwards a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? So uh, moving ahead, and so what we'd like to do is issue the, the bid packages. That'll give us a final budget number. Uh, those will be due. Oh, those will be due. Uh, yeah. December 8th, that's going to give us some time to know where the budget numbers came in at. From that point on, uh, we'll work that model, work the financial model, 
And then uh, we'll come back to council. Our plan is to be back to council on December 22nd and uh, have a discussion and then probably present the project as a whole and then uh, see where to go from that point. So uh, we were pretty surprised when we got the estimates back from the engineers. So um, the only thing we can do is move forward and see what the prices are, so. Okay. Blame the engineers. All right, anyone, All right. go ahead, Steve. Okay, so I, yeah, I was just was commenting to, to Grant here. So we're talking two more winters in our current facility. So with the improvements, that we have made because of the derecho damages, do we have any concerns about our current facility lasting through two more winters? Um, the current, so I'll, I'll read this. So right now we're working on the current facility. We're getting the roof repairs done right. right now. We'll be, we think we'll be okay. The only concern we have is that fabric tension structure. Right. And so we do have a contractor in place that can come in and patch it when we need to. Okay. Um, but we should be okay. But to sum it up, um, we're we're gonna have some work to do to get us get us through that. Uh, okay. All right. Anything else, Ryan? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to engineering E one. I need to go back up one, one slide. There we go. Um, so what we're proposing is that we apply to the water infrastructure fund um, through the Iowa Finance Authority for segment seven. So those that uh, recall, that's the trunk sewer that goes basically from Menards to the Mount Calvary Cemetery. Uh, that's a joint project between City, Rap City of Cedar Rapids, Marion, Hiawatha, Robbins, and Lynn County. Uh, that was estimated at about $7 million. It's almost at $10 million right now. We can apply up to 15% of that towards the WIF program, which is uh, ARPA money that they have allocated towards sanitary and water projects. So hoping that it scores well and we can help and take some of that inflation that we're seeing with all construction projects and get them to pay for a That's portion a of it. All right, uh, grant program. What's that? Is that? It's a grant program? Yep. Okay. okay. Any questions? Mike on that. All right, go ahead. E2. And then the, the next item is just our second and third reading. We'd like to request that we waive the our typical rules and get that since the sign is already up and go ahead and get the ordinance so that it backs up the sign that's up. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So that takes us to community development F1. All right. Uh, we're at the final reading of the zoning map update um, since uh, beginning in 2000, I think, uh, when we started this project. Um, I provided an update in the staff report regarding the conversation that occurred last meeting uh, by the individual that came to the city council meeting. Um, he had some concerns and timing concerns, I guess, with the zoning and the impact on the property that they had just purchased about a month, month and a half ago. Um, I was hoping to have a meeting with them prior to this meeting, and I've reached out to them several times and I've not heard back. Um, but uh, looking at that, the BR zoning, sorry, I'm going to zoom in there. Uh, the, high, the property highlighted is uh, the, the subject property in question. Uh, the proposed BR zoning, business regional zoning, um, is, uh, it seems like it meets what they were looking for initially. Um, they were after some contractor type flex space, kind of what we've seen elsewhere in the community. Uh, and that's allowed in the uh, BR as a heavy, uh, heavy, uh, heavy retail designation. Um, so I feel it's a use that they, they could do. Um, there are some limitations, you know, just outside storage versus items outside that are for sale. Um, but I felt like it, it could meet that. I expressed that to them uh, three times now. Again, I've not heard back. Um, 
but as it sits, uh, the property is land use designated in our comprehensive plan for commercial. Uh, so staff is still proposing a commercial designation for the property. Um, they show up Thursday and speak on it. I guess I, hopefully I'll hear from them before then, but um, I have not. Uh, the balance of the map remains unchanged from what you guys have seen. So, did you say they want to do contractor condos? We call, I call them contractor condos. It's it's kind of similar to what's being done by um, some other areas of the community. Um, what kind of design so, uh, standards apply to that? Today, none. Uh, we're yeah. working through the design standards, as you uh, hopefully you know. Right. Uh, that's been <laughs> stalled at city council or installed at the planning and zoning commission for a couple of months, trying to get off center on a few minor items uh, left in that code. But that'll probably be coming to the council probably. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say first meeting in December to be conservative. So if they pull permit prior to that, that's fine. So it could it. be a metal building. Haven't seen it yet. Right on the highway. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. So uh, is this in front of those that row of houses? No, 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 no I'm no. sorry. Um, I, the highlighted area there would be by Victory, north of Victory and Gymnastics, yes. uh, east of the, the truck stop come and go. Okay, we're on that side, that highlighted area. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the little yellow highlighted area, the, the come and go truck stops right here, Victory Gymnastics and that Ninja course are right there where the hand is. The police okay. station is the blue. Okay, I'm with the mayor on this because we keep asking for these design standards. And I think I specifically asked one of the last meetings, even with the design standards as proposed, what does that do to some of this area? Because some like industrial and some of that wasn't impacted. So if that hasn't changed, is, is that proposed? I'm looking at your coloring. Is that, that would be industrial. So even if we had the design standards, would they not be impacted by if, that? If, if, they, if we had the design standards adopted, uh, anything in shown in the red there would be affected. It would be affected. Yes, the industrial, we have not uh, taken on the industrial. That's kind of its own monster in terms of design standards. So that's a, that's a come back and circle around too. But the question being, because that zoning is not, okay, so this would be impacted by the design standards. So people coming into, I mean, this is a gateway again to our community and this is a first, actually almost more a first impression space. So I guess we've opened up another can of worms that are beyond their request about zoning because we're the other piece Correct. of it. Okay. Thanks. That's all I got. Anything else on this item? Okay. All right, uh, next item is the Sycamore Heights preliminary plat. Uh, this is the plat we saw several, several months ago, late summer. Uh, they had come in with um, 80, 83 odd lots. Uh, the council, um, uh, I believe, tabled the discussion and the developer withdrew his request after that. Uh, he, they heard what you had said and they resubmitted uh, with 65 single family lots. Um, if you recall, they were um, 50 feet wide. Uh, now they're proposing 60 feet wide. And this exhibit is in front of you if you can't see it on the screen. Um, so they came back with the meeting the minimum requirements of 60 feet. Um, the Planning Zoning Commission met last, well, several months ago and did recommend approval uh, subject to the zoning change, which is the agenda item, just kind of right before this one. So if you approve the final reading of the zoning, uh, this plat will follow. Uh, 60 foot wide for uh, kind of getting an idea what that looks like. Uh, that's the old Regency development north of 29th Avenue that developed in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it's some of the uh, Robson development off 29th Avenue would be kind of similar as well. Then you get east of 13, uh, that those developments are 60 to 65 foot range. So it's it's providing a, uh, it's providing um, smaller lots, but definitely providing a need in the community. Um, it'll meet all the traditional setbacks uh, 25 on the front, seven on the sides. Uh, the zoning did have some special conditions to it uh, regarding some extra landscaping and uh, fence limitations and shed limitations when they back up to uh, um, 44th Street North. So. Questions? Okay, F6. 
Uh, F6, uh, this is the uh, preliminary plat for the Marion South substation addition. This is located on 144th Street. Uh, some of you may remember this from a few years ago. Uh, this came before the council um, and there was a, a, it was approved. Preliminary plats by code are only valid for two years. Um, to make them last forever, you have to final plat a portion of the property. They have not final platted a portion of this property yet. So thus the preliminary plat expired and they have to go back through the approval. Uh, this did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission last two weeks ago and they did recommend approval seven to zero. So it's really, I don't wanna call it a it's re approval, but it's a renewal essentially of an approved preliminary plat. Um, this is the site of a future electrical substation. There you go. Um, this was approved several years ago through the um, conditional use process. It went to the Zoning Board of Adjustment um, well, 2019, so almost uh, three years ago. Um, since that time, they've uh, begun running lines to the site, closing, phasing sites. So um, they've begun kind of work on the substation without actually beginning work on the property, if that makes sense, because they have to relocate things and it's all how it's designed and engineered. Uh, so on the on this script image there, you do have the, uh, the site plan. I know it doesn't show much, but it's a it's a, it's a pad basically with the typical electrical substation uh, facilities. Uh, they did do some landscaping renderings, uh, so it will be landscaped entirely around it. Um, well, so that was a big discussion the last time, right? The, at, two, at, the two discussions, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so is that the same? Is it still the same? I mean, they promised a really robust screening. Uh, landscaping for screening. This is I what mean, was approved by the by the Board of Adjustment with yeah. the conditional use, and that is locked in. Okay, so has, that hasn't changed. That has not changed. Okay. I think it was somewhere in the $200,000 range, if I remember. It was an extensive like that, landscaping plan. That they were going to spend on landscaping, yeah. so, okay. Any, any questions? All right, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, this brings us to the closed session. Mary, make a motion to adjourn the closed session regarding real estate transactions and litigation as permitted under section 21.51. Set a J. I don't have my glasses. Okay. It's, it's a J. Okay, J and section 21.51C of the Code of Iowa. Two separate items. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn to closed session regarding real estate transactions and litigation as permitted under the Code of Iowa. May we have the council statement, please? Thank you, Your Honor. I've reviewed the proposed subject matter for the closed sessions and find the same to be appropriate under Iowa Code Section 21.51J and 21.51C. Thank you. Any discussion before we vote? Roll call, please. Mr. Harper? Yes. Mr. Jensen? Yes. Mayor Aguasli? Yes. Mr. Brandt? Yes. Ms. Menzer? Yes. Mr. Sternett? Yes. Okay, we're adjourned to closed session. Thank you for joining us.